Hello and welcome to Peoria Riverfront Museum's Viewing Room Live, Illinois Women and the Fight for the Vote. I am Lottie Fittis, a curator of history here, and tonight we are so grateful to have Lori Osborne with us. Lori is the director of the Evanston Women's History Project, a community-wide project to document the significant contributions uh, Evanston women have to the community. Uh, she also serves as the director of the Francis Willard House Museum in Evanston, Illinois. And currently she serves on the board of the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites, which works to increase the level of women's history interpretation at all historic sites. She's the Illinois coordinator for the Votes for Women Trail, which is a project of that national collaborative in honor of the 100th anniversary of suffrage. Um, she also serves on the Women's Suffrage Advisory Committee for the League of Women Voters of Illinois. Uh, in addition, she holds a master's degree in English literature from the University of Chicago and a master's degree in public history from Loyola University. So thank you so much, Lori, uh, for being with us. Um, just a quick note, a couple of things before we get started. Um, we will be taking questions tonight, so please just type them in the comment section of our Facebook page and we will uh, make every effort to get to them. So this evening, we will discuss the long fought battle for suffrage and the achievements of Illinois women during this period. Uh, one historical fact that I think quite a few people know is that Illinois women, uh, or excuse me, Illinois was the first to ratify the 19th Amendment, um, but uh, preceding that by about six years, Illinois was the first state east of the Mississippi to uh, grant women the right to vote for presidential elections. Um, they still weren't able to have full suffrage and they were unable to vote for legislators on both sides of uh, state and federal level, but nonetheless, uh, Illinois was the first, uh, or one of the first, um, to allow women the right to vote. So tonight, Lori is going to sort of take us through that history, and we are very excited to learn more and celebrate the 100th anniversary. Lori? Hi, thanks so much, Lottie. That was a great introduction, um, and we're going to hear more about those two important moments in 1913 and 1919, and all, a little bit of what led up to that moment. I'm going to share my screen now so we can get started on the story, and then please do um, Put any comments and questions, Lottie, you're welcome to interrupt me at any point if you want me to clarify or go into something a little bit more. Um, as Lottie said, I am involved in a couple of different women's history things, a little bit of, a lot of women's history going on right now. Um, but this is a photograph on the right. This is a, the Francis Willard House where I serve as the director, as Lottie mentioned. That's a photograph of Francis Willard there. Um, and I also run the Evanston Women's History Project. The two websites um, for both of them are down at the bottom here. And this, um, the Willard House is, um, Francis Willard is probably best known as the um, leader of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, um, which was headquartered um, for many years in this house, um, as well as the house being her home. But um, Willard, the WCTU was also a very, very significant suffrage organization. And we'll hear a little bit about that um, in a minute. Um, and also, I am the uh, uh, oops, sorry about that. Um, the um, web designer and, um, you know, sort of uh, chief gatherer of information for Suffrage 2020 Illinois, um, which is um, the website where a lot of this story and more of the story, if you're interested, go to Suffrage 2020 Illinois. A lot more than I can say in a brief presentation tonight is here on this website. Um, and then finally, um, the National Collaborative um, is working on this National Votes for Women trail. Right now, there are 
uh, 50 odd sites from Illinois on this map. It's going to be an interactive covering the whole country with um, women's suffrage story. As you notice, so there is a lot of women's suffrage that happened outside the East Coast. Um, and there, it really was a national movement. And this map goes a long way to show that and to demonstrate that. So. Um, I encourage you to explore more. There's lots of suffrage information online right now. Um, and these are ways you can connect. So to get started with the Illinois story, when Illinois enters the union in 1818, its constitu constitution, like those of the other 20 states, expressly gave the vote only to white male inhabitants above the age of 21 years. And in Illinois' second constitution, adopted in 1848, allowed men to vote for a greater number of officials than previously, but it still excluded women from the ballot. That same year, in Seneca Falls, a group of women came together um, in New York to draft a resolution calling for women's rights, including the right to vote. And even among these women, whose demands for greater equality and political rights challenged the status quo, women's suffrage was still a very controversial, even radical proposal. So we, um, in these early years, Illinois isn't really known to have much suffrage activity, if any activity at all. The first real suffrage activity in the state that we know of that's documented was in a little town called Earlville, Illinois, where they formed the first suffrage association. Um, Earlville is a small town in LaSalle County. And Susan Hoxie Richardson, who was Susan B. Anthony's cousin and a graduate of Oberlin College, lived in Earlville. And we assume that she brought um, the movement with her to, um, to Earlville. Um, and the first speech in Illinois in support of suffrage that we know of was given by Mr. A.J. Grover, who was editor of the Earlville newspaper or the Earlville transcript. So um, that's when we really date um, the first suffrage activity um, in the state. It doesn't really take off though until the 1860s, until the post-Civil War period. And in 1868, Cirrhosis, a Chicago women's club was formed in part to advance the cause of women's rights. And the group begins formulating plans for a state convention. Um, but they soon um, are divided over how to go about the suffrage movement. And this is a, these divisions are a theme that plagues the suffrage movement um, throughout its history, um, being divided on track tactics and strategies. Um, so there were two simultaneous suffrage conventions in Chicago in February of 1869. Um, and these conventions are among the earliest really formal activism, and they lead to the first suffrage statewide suffrage association being formed, the Illinois Women's Suffrage Association, the IWSA. Um, the divisions um, in the Illinois movement are reflected in national divisions at this time. Um, and really the divisions come over whether African-American men should be granted suffrage in the 15th amendment to the constitution. And um, many also were divided over whether suffrage should take a state by state approach, whether or not the way to get gain suffrage is for each state, sort of a state's rights approach to voting, or whether there should be a federal amendment um, granting full suffrage similar to the 15th amendment. So in this time period, there's actually two national suffrage associations divided along these lines, one called the American Women's Suffrage Association and the other the National Women's Suffrage Association. And these two organizations are not reconciled for more than 20 years, so not until the 1890s. So a key figure in these time, this time period is Frances Willard, 
Um, and I'll give you a little bit of background about Frances Willard, and then we'll talk about why she was important. She, Frances Willard was born in 1839 in New York and comes to Evanston in Illinois, actually, from Wisconsin, where she's grown up, to go to college, um, a small women's college in Evanston. She gets involved in the women's temperance movement after several years as an educator, um, uh, when the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, is founded in 1874. And one of the key ways that Frances Willard contributes to the uh, suffrage movement is by expanding on an early idea um, about women's suffrage, that women should vote as part of their traditional role as mothers, wives, and daughters. It's Willard who coins the term home protection. And her first um, work for the home protection ballot happens in Illinois. Um, and, and it's Evanston and Illinois women who are, who are really working on this idea of, of women gaining a partial ballot. They'll only vote on things that matter to them um, as mothers, wives in their traditional role. They're gonna vote on things like whether or not a saloon is allowed in their town. They're gonna to vote on whether who serves on their school board, things that matter to them as mothers and wives. So um, this partial ballot idea is a, it's actually a strategy. It's a wedge idea. You get a little bit of voting and everyone sort of sees that you can vote and you can participate in the political process and you will gain more voting by voting. Um, and so um, this idea is a really significant idea and it's really Illinois women who are among the formers of this strategy to gain women the vote. Of course, there's big opposition to this idea. Um, and one of the bigger, biggest opposition forces are the brewers and the distillers who certainly do not want women voting to keep the saloons out of their towns. So um, Frances Willard and other Illinois women kind of uh, uh, popularized this whole strategy of a partial ballot. And they also popularized the strategy and they're really working on the state by state, the local approach. So um, in um, 1890, the Illinois Women's Suffrage Association adopts a new name. They, they now are called the Illinois Equal Suffrage Association. And this means they've transformed their mission from political equality with men to political enfranchisement of women. And that's an important distinction because working for equality is always something that women struggle with. Um, in this time period especially, that may be a little bit pushing the boundaries of, um, of what women are expecting. They can ask for political enfranchisement, but maybe not equality quite yet. That may be too much to ask for. Um, and so that partial ballot that I was talking about earlier, um, or that home protection ballot, succeeds actually. By 1891, Illinois women are voting for school boards and school elections. And this wedge, once again, leads to more women voting, demonstrating that they can handle being in the poll, polling places, and they can manage their votes, and they can effectively. Lots of women actually run for school board in these early years in the 1890s. So this is an important moment. This is also the time we're going to speak about what Ida B. Wells a little bit later. This is when Ida B. Wells starts paying attention to suffrage in the state, because this is a power for Black women as well as white women um, in Illinois. So um, in 1894, the Chicago Women's Club establishes probably the most powerful suffrage organization in the state, the Chicago Political Equality League. Lots of women's clubs themselves did not endorse suffrage either way. It was very common for women's clubs to avoid this controversial issue. So in Chicago, the, they did a spinoff organization and that's the organization that's gonna work for suffrage suffrage because that's you know all their members who support suffrage can go and work there um, without com the controversy in the, the club so uh, sorry Lori yeah, go ahead um, if I may ask so 
we know that this is kind of happening um, in northern Illinois. I know that it's happening um, in southern, or I'm sorry, in central Illinois here. Women are, are taking up the ballot and voting for school board, and they're showing up to the polling places. And um, smaller uh, suffrage groups are, are becoming organized in the areas. So is this something that's happening throughout the entire state? Do you know um, what, was there a, a significant level of pushback um, once, when, once this got into the 1890s? Um, or were more people sort of coming on, on board um, with the idea of, of women gaining, gaining the right to vote? I would say that this time period is a little quiet. Um, this moment is important, this 1891 moment, but it kind of comes and goes. And um, it's really in the early or the late teen, the late um, 1900, you know, 1909, you start to see by 1910, the suffrage activity is really building in the state. Um, so that first, um, I'll speak about Catherine Juan McCulloch, what's going on in these interim years, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not rising to anyone's attention level like it does um, some years later. Um, and it's probably not a fully statewide movement right at this moment. Um, yeah, Chicago is really um, the locus and the Northern part of the state I'd say then extended. Yeah, does that answer your question? Oh, sorry. So Catherine McCulloch, is an important figure in this time period. Um, and she um, is the next generation after Frances Willard. She's in the same generation as Ida B. Wells and Jane Addams, speaking of um, the next group of women leaders in the state. And um, Catherine is born in 1862 in New York, but grows up um, in uh, near uh, Rockford, Illinois, um, and goes to school with Jane Adams. Actually, they know each other at Rockville, Rockford Female Seminary. Um, and But she comes to Evanston, she goes to law school and comes to Evanston um, with her husband and starts a law firm. And Catherine is um, starting to work as legal counsel for the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the National American Women's Suffrage Association as her law career is starting to grow. And Catherine uses her legal abilities and skills to start examining the Illinois Constitution, to start reading and writing legislation to gain women rights in lots of areas, including suffrage. And one of the things that Catherine discovers that the Illinois Constitution doesn't fully bar women from voting on all elected offices. So Catherine writes the legislation and brings it to the legislature in 1893 that will grant Illinois women the right to vote on all offices that aren't barred by the Illinois Constitution. Changing the Illinois Constitution is very complicated. And when they try to change it, it women's suffrage does not get included. So she decides to do a workaround. She's smart enough, she can tell that there's a new strategy, there's a way to work around this problem and that's what she starts to do. So in 1893 she starts presenting the legislation um, and in these same years we see that union again of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. We also see suffrage starting to fall in western states. So Wyoming territory, um, once Wyoming is a territory, women have suffrage there. When it becomes a state in 1890, it carries women's suffrage into its state constitution. Same thing with Utah, Colorado grants women the right to vote in 1893, Washington, California, Oregon, Kansas, and Arizona all fall into place in these years. If you notice, all of these are Western states. All of them are not very populous states. The impact, yes, these are important things that women are voting in these states, but there's not enough of them to start really influencing politics on a national level. So we get to the early part of the 20th century and you start to see some real changes in strategy and focus. 
the first thing that happens is something that isn't explored a lot, which is the changing of municipal suffrage laws in Chicago and the work to change um, that um, the right for women to vote in the city. It doesn't pass in 1919, but what happens is a coalition of women's organizations are formed. And this is when you start to see a lot of activity throughout the state body, like what you were asking, is when this these coalitions of women's organizations start forming, not just in Chicago, but all over the state. So women are joining together across lines that usually have divided them, race and class, um, to get this passed. It doesn't work, but the coalitions do work, and they stay together to work together. Um, in 1910, a new figure enters the scene. Grace Wilbur Trout becomes um, the head of the Chicago Political Equality League and the Illinois Equal Suffrage Association. Grace Wilbur Trout is a woman of some prominence and wealth, and she lives in Oak Park. Um, and she uses a different set of approaches than McCulloch does. And it's Trout's new approach that really leads us into this next phase. She um, creates new ideas around gaining publicity, including holding parades and auto tours throughout the state. She establishes a headquarters for the organization in Springfield in order to be close to legislature. She organizes um, in every senatorial district a suffrage association. So there, we know there were some that didn't have them because because she's making an effort to organize them so that senators are being spoken to by people who are their own constituents, not those women from Chicago only. Um, and she, um, this strategy works. And in 1913, oh, there's, there's Grace in a suffrage parade on Michigan Avenue. In 1913, Illinois women are gained partial suffrage. Now, a lot of people might think this doesn't sound very powerful, partial suffrage, and it's true. They were barred from voting on lots of things, but they were voting for presidential electors. That was not prevented from the Illinois Constitution. So women now have national power and are in Illinois and are influencing presidential elections. And because of Illinois' sizable population and because of the number of black women who live in Illinois, this is a power no other state has given its women. It can really change the landscape nationally. So really important moment in, in Illinois history. So Ida B. Wells is, um, I've mentioned her, she really comes to um, prominence in the 1890s. Um, she, Wells was born a slave in Mississippi and grows up in Memphis and starts working as a school teacher, but becomes a pioneering journalist when she starts to um, notice the problems of lynching in the South. Um, actually throughout the United States and starts documenting the problem in her newspapers. Um, and she uh, really is forced to move north because of this journalism um, and her ability to uncover the real story of what's happening with race and racism in the US. Um, and she settles in Chicago um, and continues her work to reform um, um, on this and other issues. Um, she does get very involved in the 1890s in suffrage, but what we really probably know her best for is a couple of moments in, in the early um, 1912, 1910 to 1913. In 1913, she forms the Alpha Suffrage Club in January of 1913. And she represents the Alpha Suffrage Club in a suffrage parade in Washington, DC in March of that year. Um, where she encounters um, racism on a very specific level. Um, she is asked by leaders of the Illinois delegation, they are told that the, the march cannot be integrated, that their delegation, though it has traveled to Washington DC together, must be separated and that Wells needs to march at the end of the march with all the other African-American women. Um, and Wells refuses to do this. She's asked by the Illinois delegation, the leader is Grace Wilbur Trout, 
Trout says we can't do anything but follow what the national leaders want us to do. And, try, and Wells says, I'm sorry, I will march with you or I will not march at all. Um, what happens is that Wells actually joins the delegation midway and marches with them regardless. Um, and so the Illinois delegation marches as a whole. Um, and they come home from that march. Um, the march is, is quite a spectacle um, because the women are treated so poorly and the news coverage of that suffrage march sort of brings them home on a wave of sentiment in support of women's suffrage. And it is following that march, the Illinois delegation comes home and the statewide campaign is in earnest. And it's in June of 1913, just three months later that Illinois women are voting for president and other elections. So, so Wells is this moment is such a critical moment. And Wells really starts the year with forming that Alpha Suffrage Club. And by June, she's seen this success of the movement. So really important moment. Um, but, um, oh, and then here, this is actually not the Alpha Suffrage Club. We've learned that this is actually a different group. I, there is no photograph of them um, all together like this. Um, we're still looking for it. Photographs are hard to find, but um, um, stay tuned. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. So how many women um, were involved um, with the Alpha Suffrage Club? And then how many Illinois women then traveled um, to DC? I, it was a significant number because didn't the Chicago Tribune send a, a journalist with them? Yeah. And was that because of the number or just because this was sort of the first big convening in, in history or to that point of women you know, stepping out and using uh, their their voices to advocate for uh, voting rights. Yeah, so um, there were 65 uh, delegates. The number, the exact number who, that traveled from Illinois is a little under question. The Tribune reporter who travels with them says 65. Um, but yes, that's a big group. They charter a special train. They're given all this treatment. All you know, they travel overnight to get to Washington D.C. Wells is the only African American woman who travels with them, and I don't know the number of people who were members of the Alpha Suffrage Club. Um, that's a really good question. I don't know if we have a number of actual members. Um, but um, it, what they, that club ends up being very important following that 1913 vote because Wells really mobilizes that club to uh, register when African-American women to vote. She uses all this new power to solidify the power in Chicago, especially, but throughout the state. Um, African-American women are living all over Illinois. So that vote is critical um, and really grants a lot of power that isn't found anywhere else in the US. So um, Illinois really is the first place where that power is exercised by black women in any kind of number, significant number. Um, but yeah, that reporter travels, thank goodness they sent the reporter because we really do know what happened at the march. Um, and there's a lot more about this on that Illinois, Suffrage 2020 Illinois, if you wanna dig in on that. Great, thank you, Lori. Um, so just quickly, oh, um, there were two big suffrage parades in Chicago on Michigan Avenue, one in 1914 for um, to celebrate and to encourage registration after that 1913 vote to get people. So the parade continues to be this method of gaining publicity um, and um, uh, getting people interested, getting uh, the women's present presence known. And then when the Republican National Convention is held in June, which Illinois women are gonna be voting for president, which is why the convention is held in Chicago in 1916. Um, they march in the rain to demand that the Republicans add women's suffrage to the platform. They're unsuccessful. Um, and uh, this becomes a real sticking point that the Republican, neither 
political party. The only party that endorses suffrage is the progressives and the prohibition party, actually, um, in this time period. So um, in June of 1919, as Lottie mentioned, June 4th, the 19th Amendment is passed. And in June 10th, Illinois is well prepared to be the first state to ratify the 19th Amendment. Illinois is first. And then an hour later, Wisconsin uh, ratifies the amendment and then Michigan. So the three Lake Michigan states are on the first day ready to ratify the 19th Amendment. And it takes more than a year um, for the amendment to actually get passed um, by the 36th state, Tennessee. Um, and we're coming up on that 36th state in, the, in this August, um, the anniversary of that ratification. Um, but in the meantime, a couple of port important things happen in Illinois. Um, the National American Women's Suffrage Association holds its convention in Chicago in February. Um, and the League of Women Voters is formed at that convention ahead of the passage of the 19th Amendment because so many women are voting, including Illinois women. Um, and so we need a League of Women Voters to educate, to form, um, help women to register, to get them to understand their voting rights. Um, so that is formed in January, I mean, February of 1920. So, like I said, August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment is ratified. And the last document of the Illinois Equal Suffrage Association, the last document ever printed by them, ends with this phrase, the political liberty of the women of the United States is forever established. We are citizens. And if you notice, the word is citizens. They very much feel the lack of citizenship, the lack of consideration of them as full citizens. So now with the ratification, that citizenship is confirmed. So um, let me stop sharing my screen and then we can talk and answer questions if people have them. Great, thank you so much, Lori. That was a wonderful, uh, presentation. Um, so I'm going to start by just a couple um, general questions um, that we often get. And uh, one of them in regards to the marching, um, I think this was probably the largest um, display, but could you talk a little bit about women's suffrage colors and uh, the wardrobe and the fashion uh, that they wore during these marches. Yeah, there's some great photographs of the Illinois women. Actually, a woman from Park Ridge designs a special cap and something called a baldric that's sort of a like a an extended sash with a belt that they all wore. The the suffragists were very very aware of their presentation. They wanted to stand out. They really wanted to be. Um, um, use that visual, um, and they're gaining some sense of that visual nature, um, the visual, the publicity that can be gained with it. So the suffrage colors were white and purple and gold in the US. You'll see green sometimes in suffrage things, but that wasn't used in the United States. That's a UK, you know, if there's green in the insignia, it's from the, it's from England, it's from the United Kingdom. Um, the other thing that was different between between the uh, movement in, um, in England and the movement in the US is in England, they use the term suffragette. In the United States, no suffragist would have ever called herself a suffragette. It was coined as a diminishing term just a little suffragette, you're just, and it was meant to insult and diminish the movement. And in England, they said, okay, fine, we'll be suffragettes. They took the term and made it their own. In America, they said, no, we are suffragists. We will always be suffragists. You're, you know, we're not gonna uh, use that term. So that's something important. It's, um, it's so commonly heard, but, um, but it's- Yeah, I, I don't think that's a, um... 
a difference uh, many people know. Um, so what happened to some of the leading um, suffrage women of Illinois after the 19th Amendment um, is, is ratified? Well, we know that Trout, Trout was done. Trout wanted to be, she was ready to stop. She continued after 1913, um, but her leadership, she stayed involved in the League of Women Voters. Like most of the members of the, of all the suffrage organizations just converted their memberships to the League of Women Voters. Wells, of course, goes on to continue reform work. Um, suffrage is just one of many things she's working on. So um, she uses voting rights and she's working to ensure voting rights. She's working to make sure those voting right restrictions don't um, come into place, but there's many other reform e efforts that she's making. Same thing with McCulloch. McCulloch is really shifts to um, other work in the League of Women Voters, other legal, share legal career continues. She's working on women's rights and on also a broad level. Suffrage is just one of many things that she's working on. Um, and I think that's probably true for a lot of them. Some of them go on to work on the uh, Equal Rights Amendment. The Equal Rights Amendment, I think, is introduced in 1922, the first time by the National Women's Party. Alice Paul is the leader. She's the uh, she writes the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and so some of them go on to work through the National Women's Party, which continues um, after the National Women's Party doesn't wrap up its work after suffrage is passed. Um, they go on to work on women's rights in general and the ERA. Um, and we, of course, just Illinois goes from being the first state to ratify the 19th Amendment to the state that never ratifies the ERA until this year. Um, so that's an interesting story too of how the political landscape and women's lives change and shift and the story changes. So. Yeah, it's, it is so interesting to think about. Um, as I had mentioned to you, you know, Peoria is the home of um, Betty Friedan, who of course was, um, you know, in some circles considered uh, the mother of, of what would become the very public um, ERA movement. Um, but in others, she was sort of, she, she led the groundwork, but then um, she didn't necessarily keep up with it. So it would be a great uh, second part um, to this conversation to sort of look at the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, so there were two uh, factions of the suffrage movement at the national level. Um, where, how, where did Illinois fall sort of within the national movement um, as a whole? So initially, Illinois uh, aligns itself with the, the um, let's see, the American Women's Suffrage Association, which supports the 15th Amendment. Um, but it changes. And over the time, Illinois shifts its allegiance to the National Women's Suffrage Association um, and is um, pushing for the state by state, um, the approach. Really, Illinois specializes in let's get state suffrage. Um, and that's its main goal in these years. The federal amendment only really happens in Illinois. I mean, there's work towards it, but you see it most after the 1913 vote. You see, okay, so now we have the vote, but now we have to work for the federal amendment because we didn't get the whole thing. We still only have a partial ballot. We're only partial citizens. So we can't get the Illinois constitution to change. So the state by state approach only goes so far, but they really feel that the wedge that, that you know, once the door is open, we can keep getting the door open. Um, they feel that's the, that that's the strategy that's going to work. So, so since um, Illinois was um, speaking of kind of that that wedge approach and how Illinois women you know really advocated for that after Illinois grants um, women partial suffrage in 1913, um, did women go on? Did Illinois women go on to other states to advocate and? Um, 
such in, in other states or were they still just really concentrated and, and focused in on Illinois? No, they really now take it take it outside. Um, people are really paying attention to Illinois women voting. Women uh, after 1916, especially with the experience of registering women to vote and getting them to the polls and changing the polls so that, you know, women, the po polling and elections in America were raucous sort of drunken affairs in many places. So this idea that women would even want to be at a polling place, um, how is that going to work? When Illinois tries all these things out for the rest of the country, then they take that experience and they say, okay, so here's how we're doing it here. And people are watching. Um, believe me, people in New York State are watching closely because no one wants Illinois women being the only ones in power. Um, Illinois women are known for to be reformers. That coalition um, holds in these years of people working for labor, uh, changes in labor laws, changes in other other rights for women. So no one, people are worried that Illinois is going to be running the country. Um, and so, um, so other states are paying attention um, too. And then of course, there's always prohibition. So um, of course, prohibition gets passed before the 19th Amendment. It's the 18th Amendment. Women don't vote for prohibition. Men do. So there you go. All right. Well, again, thank you so much, Lori. Um, before we sign off on this, is there one thought um, or historical note that we should leave with our audience tonight on um, the upcoming uh, 100th anniversary and Illinois' role in helping to make that happen? Yeah, I, my, I, like, I like to say Illinois was first twice. Um, and I'm not sure that Illinois gets a lot of credit for that being being this way. Um, and, uh, you know, it, we're sort of still in the flyover country mode. People don't necessarily recognize the importance that we play here. Um, but being that, being out of the limelight, being out of the center of attention, and being a real reform-minded state um, might be in our blood. And, and it's sort of um, interesting to watch this moment particular moment and see those things play out. So um, I, I, I kind of like to highlight that moment and, and tell everyone, if you do watch the American experience, if you do watch the vote, watch it. I encourage you to watch it. It's great. It's a really good exploration of the same time period, but think about what it doesn't say about Illinois as you're watching it. And you know more than they do. So you now know more than they do. So that's, you know, that's a fun little thing to do too. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And um, thank you so much, Lori. Thank you to the Peoria Riverfront Museum Visionary Society and members for helping make the virtual museum possible. And um, I have to thank the local organizations that um, the Peoria Riverfront Museum and uh, others have been working with and our supporters. Um, we were supposed to have a 100th uh, anniversary celebration this summer. And because of the global pandemic, we um, were unable to do that. So we have postponed it to next summer. Um, so please everyone stay tuned. We're gonna continue uh, the celebration of suffrage. So thank you all and have a great night.